Wayne Williams. We're here in Sedona, Arizona. We are at the Equus Film Festival. It's a tour stop for the Equus Film Festival right here in Sedona. We're going to take you around Sedona, Arizona and show you some uh, sights around Sedona. We're also going to have you view a lot of the things that happened here at the Equus Film Festival. Join us right here on Speaking of Horses. The very beautiful area of Sedona, Arizona is located just about 30 miles to the southwest of Flagstaff. And as you can see here, some of the most gorgeous rock formations going up through the Oak Creek area, the, the Red Rock Canyon, and it's just gorgeous. The town lays right around through all of this scenery. Home of the Equus Film Festival, Sedona Stop. Like, so, you know, it might be Hi, I'm Carly Kane, and I love horse books, so I decided to write a horse book of my own. And I'm here at the Equus Film Festival Sedona Tour Stop. Um, I'm a local author, and I'm here supporting the tour and the films. And I have along with me, In the Reins, which is an Equus Film Festival Best Literary Western Award winner from 2016. And now I'm excited to announce its sequel, Cowboy Away, which is a 2018 Equus Film Festival Literary Award nominee. So we'll see what happens this year in New York City. So what inspired you to write the first book in the range? <laughs> there had to be something that, that it just you just didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to write this book. What inspired that? So I was inspired to write In the Reins um, because I've always thought of myself as an author, but more like a poet. So I always carried a journal around with me. And then one day, like lightning, Cowboy McKenna and Kelly comes to me in the form of a poem, which actually ended up being the introduction to In the Reins. And then from there, the story just kind of begged to be told. Like I never set out to write a novel. I've always been a consumer of horse books. I love horse books. I read them all. Um, but what I found was that there's a lot of jumping, there's a lot of dressage, there's a lot of Olympic books, there's a lot of rodeo, barrel racing, that sort of thing. But there isn't a lot of books about my discipline, which is Western pleasure and showing on the breed circuit. Like in, in the reins, Quarter Horse Congress makes an appearance and I talk about showing peat horses, which is what I love to do. So basically I wrote the book I wanted to read. And from there, the story wouldn't leave me alone. I was like, stop bothering me, don't pester me. But it just kept showing up in my dreams while I was sleeping. So after that lightning bolt, the Kevin Kelly moment came, I wrote the end of the book in a furious, I still handwrite, in a furious handwriting session. I wrote the entire end of the book. And then I'm sitting there going, I have an intro and I have the end. What am I going to do? So I just sat down and I started plugging away and it became in the reins. And it's been magical ever since. The horse community has been so supportive of this book. So you've used your uh, love of horses to inspire the romance novel. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background in horses because that'll tell us a lot about uh, how the book was inspired. Of course. Uh, so horses have always been a very important part of my life. I have been a horse lover since I was this big. Um, I was lucky enough to receive a horse for my 10th birthday. I was one of those girls that actually grew up owning a horse. And I showed 4-H, and she was a Palomino Porter horse, so I had experience on the horse breeding circuits. And then, um, much like my main character, Devin Brook, in In the Reins, I sold my childhood horse to follow a dream of living in New York City and working in the music industry, which was very exciting. I was an artist development representative for um, one of the biggest music companies in the world, but something was always missing, and it was horses. And I had a hard time walking past the horses for hire in the park. I went to see movies and you know the Pegasus, the TriStar Pegasus would jump out and I would feel a tear in my eye. I'd write in my journals all the time, I will have a horse again. So luck would have it, a uh, promotion took me back to my home state of Michigan. And there I found my current horse, my dream horse, Sissy. Um, and her training and my trials and tribulations with her really inspired a lot of the content for In the Rings. So I've been a horse owner pretty much all my life. <laughs> now tell us a little bit, your second book, would you hold it up please there? Of course. Cowboy Away. Now, does it, and maybe I missed this in the first part of the interview, but does it in any way follow through on the other book, or is it totally a different story? Absolutely. So, this is a series. It's an equestrian romance series. It start, book one is In the Reins, which uh, follows, um, it's a sort of mystery, romance, suspense 
uh, into a handsome cowboy as a woman rediscovers her country roots and horse ownership again. Uh, and so it kind of tells the tale of how these two have chemistry and how he becomes our horse trainer. And you meet a great bunch of people on the farm. Uh, there's a bull rider named Jamie McCall. So you get two cowboys to choose from in this book. There's the horse trainer, there's the, the bull rider, and there's the farm owner, Sophia Matilda Washington Clark, who kind of takes all of these beautiful people under her wing. And so you, you meet them all in the first book. Now in the second book, Cowboy Away, it continues exactly where In the Rains left off, and you follow um, kind of the tumultuous past of McKenna and Kelly, the cowboy, the lead cowboy. So you kind of go back to the beginning, and you learn about what brought him to Greenbrier Farm, what makes him tick, why he is kind of elusive and mysterious the way he is. So you get to know a lot about the Kenny Kelly. It kind of shifts and is told from the voice of the Kenny in, in the sequel. And it's good timing to check out the series because I am just about finished with the third book, oh, which will wow. complete the Kenny Kelly and Devin story. So now, when is this third book coming out? Is that a secret, or can we uh, impose upon you? Well, I uh, actually have been sitting out at my table working on it right now. I just passed the 70,000 word mark. Uh, in the range is 80,000 words. So I anticipate I will have it to my editor within the next couple of weeks, and I'm hoping for a release date in 2018. In other words, uh, you might be trying for Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> I will, actually in 2019, right? So Cowboy Away, well, whatever, yeah. Cowboy Away will be there in 2018, and maybe in 2019 great. I'll have a third book. Great, yeah. great, Any great, chance great. you're coming to Way in September to promote and do things there? I don't know of Way. I would love to know World of Quest Street Games. Oh, it's Toronto, North Carolina. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, I mean, that's what's been so amazing about this journey with these books, is all these incredible opportunities that have opened up and the equestrians that I'm meeting and the events that I'm able to support, like that was Film Festival and the Sedona Tour Stop. Um, and I just keep learning more. Like, that's the amazing thing about horses and horse ownership is you're constantly learning and evolving and finding new people to meet, and new uh, events to explore and go to, new disciplines to understand. Uh, I think that's why the Equus Film Festival is so amazing. These documentaries are like completely eye-opening. There are things going on in the horse world. Um, that we don't all know about. So this is like fabulous. They're everywhere. And you have to keep turning over rocks to find them because they are there. Yeah. Carly, how do people contact you? You can visit my website at www.carlykadecreative.com. And my books are found anywhere where um, fine books are sold. Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, it's available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. So uh, there you go. And you're here all weekend. Right? I am here. And you're all here weekend. in Sedona, Arizona, enjoying life. I am here in Sedona, Arizona, supporting horse films, horse lovers, horse, horse literature, and meeting really great people. Great. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Randy Helm, and I am the supervisor for the Wild Horse and Burrow Inmate Program for the State Prison here in Arizona. And the State Prison, we have exclusively Bureau of Land Management, Wild Horses, and, and Burrows. So what we do is we bring the Wild Horse and Burrows in, we care for them medically, uh, whatever the issues that the horse or burrow needs and uh, we have inmates then that are trained to care for the animals so the inmates are they have to apply for the job they they get hired and uh, some of them will work on the care side and some of them work on the training side so on the on the training side we have about 35 horses and usually about 10 burrows in training at any given time so what we'll do with the the inmates that come in is they typically have zero horse experience so uh, we will start introducing them to working with horses and of course they're working with horses that were previously in the wild we'll start them with the with the gentler horses but even at that they have to uh, learn how to groom them how to care for them and safety is a huge issue around horses regardless but uh, with the environment we're in so we will train the inmates on how to, how to start working with the horse and then by the time the inmate finishes the 
the program, and that can be anywhere from one to five years they could be working in the program. Uh, by the time they finish, they are an accomplished uh, horseman. They have learned how to not only care for them, but how to ride them and how, how to train them. So they'll take a horse that has been untouched and have that horse at the end of generally around four months. They'll have that horse uh, accomplishing everything we want on the trails, obstacle course. We have a seven acre obstacle course so we can really uh, work the horse through a, a number of scenarios. And we also can take the inmates that are trustee level inmates, we'll uh, allow them to ride, of course, supervise either myself or one of the uh, uh, employees will ride with them and we'll go down right outside the main gate down to the river bottom and, and do a, a half day ride down there and then come back. So so by the time they're finished, the, the horse has been trained and the inmate has learned to trade. The, the surprise for me with the program was the extent to which the inmates' lives were changed. I had a number of people early on say, what, what is your equine therapy program? I said, I really don't have a an intentional written out equine therapy program, but something happens when you start working with a horse and you you have to think outside yourself, you have to take responsibility. There's a bond that I really want to happen with the inmate and the horse. They know right up front that uh, there are some things they may get a warning on. Abusing an animal is not one of them. If they abuse an animal that at that moment, they're they're fired. So, so they have to have uh, anger management just worked into they have incentive to have anger management and um, process horse training is is all about process all about one step at a time and uh, they'll, they'll learn a work ethic so the interesting thing for me was the extent to which the inmates lives were radically changed in the process of working with horses do you know uh, just out of curiosity how does the prison system itself uh, make selections or determine who gets to be in the program? Um, the, what, what happens in the program, I, I select from inmates from one of our larger units. We have about 1,500 inmates on, on that unit. And when we have openings, we'll actually just put a, a flyer out on that unit and let people know, and they can apply. So those that apply will uh, look at their application, they have to be cleared by by complex, and then we'll interview them, let me back up, but, uh, uh, so, so when we interview them, what I'm really looking for is just somebody who's uh, willing to learn, willing to, to change. I can work from a trustee level to a medium security level inmate, so some of them can have some flexibility, like I mentioned, uh, going off a uh, complex to do a ride down at the river. Um, the, there are some inmates, about half the inmates, can never leave complex for any reason. They have to have constant supervision. So we'll have uh, men in for anything from uh, manslaughter, murder, down to, to theft and some of the what we would consider to be the lesser crimes. However, the, the radical change I've seen in some of these guys are the guys that come in with the more violent crimes because I think they, they connect more with the horse. Well, I think the horse can help them connect through some of their feelings is what I think. You right. correct me if I'm wrong, Randy, but it seems that there's a, a real... Uh, the horse, in some of these programs I've seen in the past, many of the inmates will say the horse did more for them than they ever did for the horse. And I, I, I think that's that's kind of a, a, a general consistent theme with the inmates that come through the program is that they, they're they the ones that gained the most and they're the ones that changed the most. And we'll have, we'll have inmates, so a lot of people don't realize the, the, the wide gamut of reasons that people come to prison. Some of them have a terrible childhood. Some of them, uh, if, if I remove drugs from the equation, I wouldn't have that many inmates. But uh, um, we have a number of inmates that were military and come back with, with PTSD. And so they'll typically start medicating with that. They'll start doing drugs to, to relieve that and they end up in prison. So there's, there's that aspect. There's the uh, guys that come in with just horrible abuse, uh, physical, sexual abuse, and they, they, have, they 
have a way to work through their issues without somebody sitting and saying, let me, let me have you talk about your issues, and they'll learn to trust, they'll learn to love, they'll uh, learn purpose, and, and it gets them out of, out of that spiral down, you know, where they're just continually digging a hole deeper for themselves. And I also think that, uh, correct me again if I'm wrong, but they're dealing with this animal, and everything the animal does as a reactionary to them, it's directly their input. Mm -hmm. They are basically picking up that daily signal that there's nobody feeding this horse information but me. Yeah. There's nobody to blame if it's wrong mm -hmm. but me. Yeah. And that eventually sinks in like, hey, I've got to pay better attention to what I'm doing. Right. You know, and, and I, I had a, a good example of of the correlation they'll make. I had a wild horse just three days ago. I did a clinic for the inmates and I had the horse uh, in a pen there, all the inmates around, and we uh, were talking about their lives, about they all come, when they get to prison they have an ADC number and it's on their ID, it's, it, it's, it's on everything, their ADC number. I had a BLM horse with a freeze mark on it. And uh, so I said, tell me the value of, of this horse if it does as much as a, you know, high bred quarter horse. And we determined that because of that mark on the horse, the value would be different. So I said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take a $1,800 saddle and put it on a $25 horse. Why am I doing that? Because I, I'm, I'm changing the the way the horse sees itself, but I, I'm going to see the horse different. So, so it really was a way for me just to say, don't let anybody put a value on you um, that uh, that is an insignificant value or that labels you. And so it gives me a real language. Um, and so I, I'm always, I, as a matter of fact, I'll say, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop being preachy. Uh, so they're used to it by now because there are so many correlations. One, I had an inmate that uh, got out of prison. And he started, he, he, he friended me on Facebook. And so I looked at his Facebook and I thought, ah, he's getting back to the same group. So I didn't have to say, hey, it looks to me like you're messing up. I just uh, sent him a message, said, you know, great to hear from you. You know, that last horse you trained came from being wild to, to an amazing new life. If you had taken that same horse and put it back in the old herd for two or three months, you would have lost all that you gained with that horse and didn't say anything else. I got a uh, response from him about, uh, I didn't hear from him for a couple of weeks. I thought, oh man, I made him mad. He said, Mr. Helm, I want you to know that I quit hanging out with my old friends. I still have a, a, a ongoing uh, connection with that inmate and I see him periodically. But it, it gives me a little language without uh, saying, you know, you're really, you're really messing up. So how do people contact you if they want to help with the program or anything? What can they do? Probably the easiest way is, is email, and that is Helm, which is my last name, H-E-L-M, Horsemanship, H-O-R-S-E-M-A-N-S-H-I-P, you know, Helmhorsemanship at gmail.com. Great. Randy, thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it very much and love what you're doing here in, uh, in Arizona with the, the inmates and the horses and how they help each other. Susan Ash and I'm the founder of Save Stop Animal Violence. I founded the organization to stop the horrific abuse of the Havasu by pack animals on the Havasu by Reservation in the Grand Canyon. My name is Katie Maria Baca and I'm a volunteer for Save. Um, my sister and I traveled the Havasu Canyon two years ago and came across a severely abused one specific horse that really touched us, um, but we saw a lot of abuse while we were there, and it caused us to reach out to Susan, and I've been since we the first. Why don't you hold your poster up about your... Susan, can you tell us a little bit more about SAVE? Sure. Um, I founded SAVE in February of 2016. Um, after too many, hearing too many stories, which are rather common knowledge in Arizona, and in particular around Flagstaff because of its proximity to the Grand Canyon, of abused, horribly abused animals in uh, 
Havasupai, by the Havasupai. And everybody kept saying the same thing. Well, there's nothing you can do. It's a sovereign nation. And to make a long story short, I just got fed up with hearing that and decided, no, there has to be something that can be done. We can't just continue to allow this kind of torture, literally. And I don't use that term lightly. It is torture what is done to those animals to continue. So um, in the spring of 2016, I met with the U.S. District Attorney's Office, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, as well as the FBI, and talked to them about what could be done. And shortly after that, the first operation went down into Supai, made an arrest of a man by the name of Liu and Joe, who's public record now. He was found guilty of uh, animal abuse. It's the first known case of a conviction in federal court by a tribal member for animal abuse, and it, it kick-started SAVE. Um, and since that time, we have built a website and built a Facebook page, and we take people through the process of how to make formal complaints to the BIA, and we follow up on those cases. And several horses have been seized, since that time, and many more people know. So, how do they contact you again? What is the website or Facebook page? It's um, www.haversupihorses.com. And spell Haversu. H A V A S U P A I. Good. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot, but most people who are going to say, okay, right. you know, I just wanted to make sure we had the correct spelling. Yeah, so. does that have? Yeah, it does have a Okay, it's H A V A S U P A I. That means I have 20 20 vision as well, right? Now, here's a visit with filmmaker Matthew Gary on backpacking in the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, so basically, we, um, we first off, we filmed in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado and uh, on the west side of the park, which is kind of the lesser known travel part of the side, you know, the east side and the west side. And uh, we went over there, it's actually been, we filmed in 2015, so it's been a little while since we actually uh, were out there. And um, we, uh, this project came about basically because of course that, uh, that, uh, was the subject of our film, was a family friend of mine since I was a kid. And we always knew that he had all these interesting jobs that he did, and he traveled the world, and he worked in New Zealand with horses, and he, and he did a lot of running horses. And we called him up and just kind of asked if if we could come make a film about him and what he does. And he was all for it. And we basically shot it in about four days, and the editing process took a little longer than that. <laughs> um, but an exciting thing is that currently, we are about to uh, expand the film into a larger project, and we had National Geographic that came and spoke with us and wants to make it into a project for them. And cool. so in a couple weeks, I'm actually going back up to Colorado, and we're going to film more. Um, we're going to go out on a packing adventure for uh, probably a week, uh, about probably 15, 20 miles out in the woods. And um, that's super, super exciting. But uh, I found myself really wanting to see where he ended up. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, but so the people that were there waiting for the animals. Totally, like, and that's absolutely something that we wanted to cover was go out there when he's, you know, actually on a pack and meet the people out there, but time just ran out, and uh, we filmed that in September, and uh, they go, and that's very near the end of their, their whole packing yeah. season, and uh, no, that's that's for the expanded project. We will absolutely go into that, and you know, there's a lot of dangers in that job, and you know, they do search and rescue as well, which I think is a really interesting piece that we didn't get to cover. And uh, usually, when they have a search and rescue operation, the horses are the first people on the ground, first on the scene, and that's something that that's kind of hard to capture because you never know when it's going to happen or really how to do it. So that's something that we're going to try and cover a little bit our next project as well. Um, but uh we'll have to have a GoPro. So. Yeah, no, yeah. We'll, we'll have a GoPro <laughs> in there as well. And, and uh, there's a lot of crazy stories that he told me that, you know, they go out and pouring rain and thunderstorms and he'll have all these horses connected and you never know what one until you get spooked. 
and he said times where he's had to jump off his horse and all the horses get separated and you know the horse wrangling up everywhere and it can be quite a dangerous and terrifying situation. So luckily they want to be together and yeah. be there. They yeah. Or go home too. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's another thing that uh, I want to expand more on is that I think that uh, it's a risky job too and these these guys out there are um, really brave. I think that's one way to put it. Was it just the two of them? Was it just him and the girl working there? It, it was. It's a very small operation on that side of the park. Um, and usually they just have a lead packer and an assistant. And you know, they'll work with rangers and they'll work with the trip and the trail crew, but in terms of the packing, it's just the two of them. And they, they carry a, a big load, you know, so to speak. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> like, but, uh, no, no, they, they work like he says in the film. They, you know, he's with horses all day, every day. Sometimes he's just handing the horses. And uh, I always thought that was fascinating that, you know, in his job, you rarely see people. Uh, How big is the area that they cover? Uh, they go, they can go up to about 20, 25 miles. Uh, that they'll go on their longest trek. Well, that's actually, you know, when they're going out there and people that are living out there for weeks, um, and they'll deliver their food and they'll take back their trash and uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, no, they can go pretty far. I mean, we didn't go that far. We went, we went about five miles, and. Uh, but I want to go. I want to go further. So that will be coming up. So did you go five miles on mules? Or did you go five miles on foot? On foot. We uh, there was a crew of four of us, and so I got a camera on my back, and we got someone holding the tripod. We got a sound guy with a boom pole. I mean, it was, it was quite a sight. We had a few rangers that came up to us and were like, uh, "What are you doing? What's going on out here?" So. Uh, we, we, we got stopped a few times for that, but we, are, we had all the permits, we, everything was clear, so. Uh, we had to actually film it when he was not working. He's a government employee, so we kind of had to film off the clock. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So that was a bit of a challenge. He's like, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. Uh, so we, a lot of times we got one take at it, and that was all we could really get. Well, that's a look at the Equus Film Festival Sedona, Arizona Tour Stop. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.